we've come to the ninth book in our study through the Minor Prophets. Remember that these books tucked in at the Old Testament were originally compiled into one scroll called the Book of the Twelve. There are 12 of them. It's the same inf information. It's organized a little differently in our English Bibles than how it was originally organized. All 12 on that one scroll combined, that scroll was not as long as, let's say, the writings of Isaiah, for example. And so these books have come to be known as the Minor Prophets. They're minor in terms of their volume, not importance. It, simply because what they say is relatively short in comparison, we, we call them that. There's nothing minor about their message. These books proclaim monumentally important truths that would have pointed the Hebrew people ahead to the Messiah. And for us, these books stand as the word of God they equip us and inform our walk with Christ as we look to him as the author and finisher of our faith. As we come to Zephaniah, we actually know quite a bit about Zephaniah in comparison to what some of the other writing prophets, in comparison to what we know about some of the other writing prophets. For Zephaniah, we have a family tree and a timestamp of when he wrote. There's no guesswork in this. And that's super helpful because there's at least three Zephaniahs that we read about in the Bible, and they all lived very near to the same time in history. Shortly before or shortly after Babylon conquered the southern kingdom of Israel. And so to eliminate any potential confusion, I just want to make it clear that this Zephaniah is not Zephaniah the priest that's mentioned in the book of Jeremiah. This Zephaniah is also not the Zephaniah that's the father of Josiah that we read about in the book of Zechariah. And that Josiah is not the Josiah that we read about in the book of Zephaniah. That's Josiah the prophet. Here in the book of Zephaniah, we read about Josiah the king. And in the book of Zephaniah, our Zephaniah is the great-great-grandson of King Hezekiah. Is that cleared up? Or are some of you so confused that you can't tell if you just heard the introduction to a sermon or if I'm just reading names out of an Amish phone book? Here's the good news. Zephaniah, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, clears all of that up for us. He doesn't leave us wondering which Zephaniah is writing. So the first question that we've been asking of each of the minor prophets, who's the author? It's Zephaniah, the great, great grandson of Hezekiah. That's King Hezekiah. His name comes from two Hebrew words. The first is Safan. That means to hide, as in to hide a treasure. It's the idea of separating something to keep it safe. The second word is just Yah, which simply means Lord or God. So his name, Zephaniah, means hidden by God. The, it's the idea, the, the idea in the meaning of his name is the idea that God is separating him or covering him to keep him safe from harm. Specifically, we'll learn safe from wrath. As with many people in scripture, the meaning of of his name adds detail to the story of his life. And the genealogy that he provides in verse 1 tells us a lot of that story. Zephaniah 1.1. The word of the Lord which came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, the son of Gadoliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. So Zephaniah, like I said, is the great-great-grandson of King Hezekiah. He served as a prophet during the reign of King Josiah. So we know who he is. We know when he wrote. Now, I have a timeline. I'm going to show you rather than just telling you. And again, this is on the paper. It should be on the screen. Zephaniah served as a prophet during the reign of King Josiah. In Zephaniah 2, we read that the destruction of Nineveh 
was still a future event. That would mean that Zephaniah prophesied in the early part of Josiah's reign. Remember, the northern kingdom had already been conquered by Assyria back in 722 B.C. All that's left of the Hebrew people is the southern kingdom called Judah. Unlike the north, Judah had a few good kings. There wasn't a single good king in the northern kingdom. Judah had a few. One of them was Zephaniah's great-great-grandpappy Hezekiah. Hezekiah saw what became of the northern kingdom. He saw how evil they became and how they rejected the prophet's warning. He saw how God allowed them to be conquered as an act of his justice. Hezekiah would have heard how Assyria marched through the land and laid waste to his relatives to the north. And Hezekiah wanted better for Judah. He honored the Lord personally, and he destroyed idols in the land the best he could. He did what he could to lead the people in honoring God's word. And then Hezekiah's son came to the throne. His firstborn son was Manasseh. Manasseh was a complete 180 from his father. He saw the evil nations surrounding him become more powerful, and so in arrogance and rebellion, he imitated every sinful practice of the idolatrous people that God drove out of the land in the past. It seems that he thought that he could have their same strength if he imitated their worship. And he even went as far as to burn his own son alive as an offering to the pagan deity Molech. Look at 2 Kings 21, 2 through 6. This is speaking of Manasseh. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah, his, his father, had destroyed. He raised up altars for Baal and made a wooden image as Ahab of, of Israel had done. And he worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. He also built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem I will put my name. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. Also he made his son pass through the fire, practiced soothsaying, used witchcraft, and consulted spirits and mediums. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. So Manasseh, bad dude. And the people, for the most part, went right along with Manasseh. They tolerated his sinful rule for almost 50 years. Now, we could be apologists for the people. We could say, well, he's the king. What are they supposed to do? They're powerless, but they weren't. In fact, Manasseh's son Ammon was assassinated after two years. The people of Judah followed this sinful and idolatrous path. And for that, God says in 2 Kings 21, 10 through 13, And the Lord spoke by his servants, the prophets, saying, Because Manasseh, king of Judah, has done these abominations, he has acted more wickedly than all the Amorites who were before him, and has also made Judah sin with his idols. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such calamity upon Jerusalem and Judah that whoever hears of it both his ears will tingle, and I will stretch over Jerusalem the measuring line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab. I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. So the sins of Judah under Manasseh rendered their judgment certain. Let's go back to that timeline again, but remember that thought. The, the sins of Judah under Manasseh, rendered their judgment certain. After Ammon, Assyria was still a threat. Babylon was a growing power. Then Josiah became king. This would be Hezekiah's great, great, uh, excuse me, uh, Josiah would be Hezekiah's great grandson, and I guess, I guess Josiah would be like Zephaniah's like second cousin. Is that how that works? Somebody tell me how that works. I think it's his second cousin. Josiah became king at eight years old. 
The Bible says that when he was 16, Josiah began seeking the Lord. He commissioned the restoration of the temple that had been closed and left in disrepair. And as it was being fixed up, a book of the law was found. And Josiah began reading God's word. Josiah was so grieved at the spiritual state of Judah that he tore his clothes in repentance. And Josiah went out and destroyed the idols just like Hezekiah, his great-grandfather, did. He reinstituted the public reading of the word of God. He reinstituted nationwide observance to the Torah. And at that time, there was a prophetess named Huldah. Huldah heard all that Josiah was doing, and God, through Huldah, revealed that because of Josiah's repentance, God would delay that sure judgment that he pronounced to Manasseh. Through Huldah, God said in 2 Chronicles 34, 28, Surely I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see all the calamity which I will bring upon this place and its inhabitants. So Josiah would be separated and kept safe, hidden from this judgment that was coming. That that sure judgment would be hidden from him. He'd be separated and kept from it. Back to that timeline, that graphic, one more time. It's, It's during that time when God's judgment is delayed Because of the repentance of Josiah, it's during that time that Zephaniah prophesied. And it's that idea that's key to understanding Zephaniah. Here's the key. While judgment is sure, those who repent and earnestly seek God are secured by God through whatever judgment he might bring. Let me say that again. While judgment is sure, those who repent and earnestly seek God are secured by God through whatever judgment he might bring. So the author is Zephaniah, the descendant of Hezekiah. His name refers to God securing something to keep it from wrath, to keep it from harm. He writes during a time of revival, but that that time is, is, is simply an intermediate period. Judgment is sure to come, nevertheless. It's on the horizon. That's the author. The audience is the people of Judah. Zephaniah makes sure to point out that what he's writing is not his own words. He says, the word of the Lord came to Zephaniah. He wants his readers to know that the things that he's going to say were revealed to him by God. And if you've ever read Zephaniah before, you could understand why he'd want to make that distinction. Things were improving in in, in Judah. Josiah was a good king. He genuinely wanted to honor God. Yet Zephaniah comes with some of the most graphic images of God's wrath anywhere in Scripture. From a a purely human perspective, it's understandable why he might say, hey guys, don't shoot the messenger. After the opening verse, the next three verses spell doom in no uncertain terms. I will utterly consume everything from the face of the land, says the Lord. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, and the stumbling blocks along with the wicked. I will cut off man from the face of the land, says the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off every trace of Baal from this place, the names of the idolatrous priests and pagan priests. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not that Zephaniah is nothing but a doomsday prophet. The book's closing words include images like this. Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord your God is in your midst. The mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Do you see some contrast in Zephaniah's message? I mean, these dual images of God striking Jerusalem in his anger and God singing in joy over his people, it's a dramatic contrast. 
But it's a contrast that's consistent with the whole of Scripture. It's consistent with the covenant promise that has always existed between God and Israel. So Zephaniah is a prophet of contrast. Graphic images of God's wrath and beautiful pictures of God's love. And it's this contrast that helps us see that Zephaniah has two messages for two very different audiences. Among the people of Judah, there was the compromising majority. Verse 6 describes them as those who've turned back from following the Lord. That's chapter 1, verse 6. In chapter 1, verse 8, Zephaniah looks ahead to the children of King Josiah, who were in fact evil. He writes, And it shall be in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children, and all such as are clothed with foreign apparel. This line about foreign apparel alludes to spiritual compromise with foreign kingdoms. Some of you are looking at the back of your tag seeing made in China and going, oh no, relax. It's not about the clothes. Josiah is going to be kept from wrath. Remember what Hold this said. The wrath isn't going to come in Josiah's lifetime. But his compromising sons, they'll know his wrath. They'll know God's wrath. Three of Josiah's sons end up being king. All three turned to the idolatry of the nations that surrounded them. All three made compromises with Egypt or Babylon. Compromises that went against the word of God. So Zephaniah has a message for the compromising majority to those who turn back from following the Lord. He has a, a message to those who give their allegiance to false gods and to human strength. But not everyone in, in Judah had turned away from God. We know that Josiah was genuinely seeking the Lord and that he wasn't alone. There were others. And in Zephaniah, we see several images, several mentions of a, of, a, of a faithful remnant. There's all these images of God's wrath, but there's this, this small little glimmer of hope for this faithful remnant, a repentant few who do seek the Lord in an age of compromise. Now, this is showing my cards a bit. I want to get into the nitty-gritty of what God actually says to those two groups of people later in the message. But as we seek to identify the audience, I suppose that some spoilers are inevitable. We first see this repentant few in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Gather yourselves together. Yes, gather together, O undesirable nation, before the decree is issued or the day passes like chaff. Before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you, seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, who have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness, seek humility, and it may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. Zephaniah saw a day where the majority would turn away from God. But in that day, there would be a repentant few who do seek the Lord, who do uphold justice. And notice this theme again. It may be that you'll be hidden, protected, covered over, kept safe, kept from wrath in the day of the Lord's anger. So Zephaniah speaks on God's behalf to two groups of people. He speaks to the compromising majority who turn away from God. He also speaks to the repentant few who genuinely do seek God. The problems that Zephaniah is addressing are problems found in that first group. There are two sins that God, through Zephaniah, points out. One we've mentioned already, idolatry. They've built altars to Baal. They've sacrificed their children to Molech. These were the false deities of the Canaanites and Amorites. 
They worshipped wealth and human power. They adopted the sinful practices of Assyria and Egypt as those nations became rich and powerful. Every form of idolatry that existed among their neighbors, they adopted into their own lives, and in it all, they blasphemed the true and living God. What this illustrates is the reality that knit into every human heart. We have an innate desire to worship something bigger than ourselves. Everybody worships something. I don't care if a person is devoutly religious or a hardened atheist. Everybody worships something. Now, few in our culture have little carved statues that we bow to. Perhaps some do, but in our modern culture, with all of our technology and all of our education, we're more sophisticated in our idolatry, aren't we? We don't build altars to Baal. We worship at the altar of personal fulfillment and gratification. We don't sacrifice our children on the altar of Molech. We sacrifice our children on the altar of convenience. In California, an unborn child can be killed for no other reason than it would be an inconvenience, and the state will pay for it with no questions asked. At the same time, you barrel rainwater coming off your downspout? Ooh, you are facing jail time or a fine for sure. Understand where we are as a culture. The Delta smelt has more rights and legal protections than a healthy child in its mother's womb. Catch that truth. An invasive fish species that's about this big and serves no purpose in the ecosystem has more legal protection than a human child. Because the Delta smelt has never been inconvenient but children often might be seen as an inconvenience. And so we sacrifice our children on that altar. And when I say we, I don't mean we. I mean culturally, this is what we have become. In our worship of the gods of this age, in our worship of self-gratification and personal fulfillment, we as a culture trample upon things that God calls sacred. Marriage is sacred. And we've changed its definition and built all sorts of convenient off-ramps to minimize commitment. Human beings are created in the image of God. That image is sacred. Human life is sacred, and a gender-inclusive social ethic is simply a convenient way to mock God's creative order and indulge mental illness. Medical assistance in dying? Well, that's just a convenient way to talk about what it really is, the state-sanctioned murder of the sick and aged. We've trampled upon the things that God says are sacred to worship at the altar of convenience. Now I realize that these are contentious issues in our culture. But these issues are really clear in the Bible, and so we've got to be careful to make sure that we're clear on these issues. At the same time, we've got to be careful to extend grace and compassion to those who might see things differently. Listen, if they call you a jerk for being clear about what the Bible teaches, that's fine. But if they call you a jerk for being a jerk, that's different. So Zephaniah addresses idolatry. But there's another problem Zephaniah addresses in his culture. It's complacency. All this idolatry was happening, and it was quelled some during Josiah's time as king. But in Zephaniah 1.12, we get some insight into the people's attitude about all the things that are going on. God says, And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps and punish the men who are settled in complacency, who say in their heart, The Lord will not do good, nor will he do evil. 
Zephaniah says that there's people who just go through life acknowledging that God exists, but for all intents and purposes, live as though he didn't. He calls out men who say, God's not going to punish us for our sin. He calls out the men who say, God won't bless or harm. He calls out the complacency of those who say, God isn't concerned with anything we're doing. And the Apostle Peter points out the same mentality in our day. 2 Peter 3, 1-7, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir you up, your, I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. Could he be alluding to Zephaniah? I think so. And of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, what should we know first? That scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their lusts. They just do whatever they want to do. And here's what they say. Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. God's not going to judge us. God's not going to do anything about our sin. He says he's going to come. He says he's going to come with wrath. Here we are. We are just keep on existing the same way we've always existed. For this, verse 5, for this, they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water by which the world then existed, by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Again, this mentality, this spiritual complacency, like the idolatry of old, it's common in our day as well. How many people, just survey the faces of the people you interact with on a regular basis. How many people could you name right now that in a conversation would acknowledge that they believe God exists? They aren't atheists, at least they don't claim to be. But how many people can you name that acknowledge that God exists, but that acknowledgement seems to have no impact on their lives? They live as though God were unconcerned with anything going on. In their complacency, they're practical atheists, even if theologically they believe in God. And in that complacency, they've become comfortable in their compromise. In all honesty, that describes the majority of people I know. And I'm willing to bet that that's true for you as well. But as I said in our study of Nahum, don't conflate God's patience with sinful people for his permissiveness of sinful behavior. Peter warns that this complacent attitude has always been common, even among those who know that God already destroyed the world once with a flood. He says the world we now live in isn't destined for a flood, it's destined for fire. Zephaniah speaks to the people of Judah and he says that God is paying attention. He is concerned with the things that are going on. He's not blind and he's not asleep. Zephaniah promises this, the day of the Lord is coming. Now, there's something that we need to understand about Bible prophecy here. And that's that second graphic on that sheet. It'll also be on the screen. Often there exists a final and former aspect to prophecy. Former and final. From the prophet's perspective, it's not former and final, it's near and far. Aspects of the prophecy will, will come into reality. This is from the prophet's perspective. Aspects of the prophecy will come into reality in the short term, and then a greater, more widespread fulfillment is still to come. From our perspective in the church age, the near fulfillment has already happened, and so we say it's former. We look back on the former fulfillment, and we look ahead to the far fulfillment, which is yet future. It's the final fulfillment. Does that make sense? 
It's just which, which side of it do we stand on, right? Are we, are we there in the moment where the prophet is giving it? Well, then it's near and far. Or are we in the church age? Well, then it's former and final, yet to come. Now, that, that idea of there being this former and final fulfillment of prophecy, that's especially true as it relates to this thing called the day of the Lord. In Zephaniah, the near fulfillment was the day that God would remove his hand of protection and allow Babylon to come and conquer Judah. Why was the judgment certain? Because Manasseh was super, super evil. From our perspective, we look back, we look back on Babylon coming and conquering Judah as a historical reality. But in Zephaniah's day, it was still in the future. It was near. But God also widens the scope in Zephaniah 2. And he says that there's a day of the Lord that's coming not just for Judah, but for all nations. Zephaniah 2, 10 through 11. This they shall have for their pride, because they have reproached and made arrogant threats against the people of the Lord of hosts. The Lord will be awesome to them, for he will reduce to nothing all the gods of the earth. People shall worship him, each one from his place, indeed all the shores of the nations. In the day of the Lord, whether near or far, former or final, God comes against evil. So the first thing I want you to see about the day of the Lord. God will destroy evil. That's what these images of wrath in Zephaniah communicate. God brings about consequences for sin, for idolatry, for rebellion, for complacency. What Zephaniah pronounces to the compromising majority of Judah is terrible. They will be conquered, driven from the land, and made subject to the wicked king of Babylon because they would not honor God as king over them. And that same thing is promised to everyone who bows to idols or lives in spiritual complacency and compromise in the day of the Lord that is still yet to come. God will destroy evil. But as I said, Zephaniah isn't all doom and gloom. There's that contrast. All through Zephaniah, there's little phrases that speak comfort to those who turn to God before the day of his wrath. There's subtle hints that through wrath, there's these people that are hidden, protected, covered over, and kept safe. He promises to one day restore that faithful remnant. So that's the second thing I want you to see about the, the day of the Lord. God will protect and restore the faithful remnant. One day he will bring them home. And we can look back at the former fulfillment, the, the near fulfillment. We can look back historically at the day when God brought a remnant of people home to Judah. Read the story in Ezra and Nehemiah. After a time of discipline and correction and ridding the land of idolatry, God brought a remnant of faithful Jews home. Still, there's a final fulfillment of that same promise that's yet to come. It's future. It's final. Just like there's a, a final judgment that's sure to come where God will come and destroy evil, there's a promise of God's protection and restoration of those who seek him now. And here's the awesome thing. God doesn't limit who can be part of that remnant. We know it's still future because it's not limited to Judah. Zephaniah calls all of his readers to repent and seek God before the final day of God's wrath. So I read this earlier. I told you it was a spoiler, but here we go. Zephaniah 2, 1 through 3, one more time. Gather yourselves together. Yes, gather together, O undesirable nation. 
people rejected, pushed aside by the culture, undesirable. Underline that word, before. Gathered together before the decree is issued. Or the day passes like chaff. Before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you. Before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. Seek the Lord. All you meek of the earth. It extends beyond Judah. You who have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. So Jesus is abundantly clear in the Sermon on the Mount that his kingdom is one in which the meek inherit the earth. And here Zephaniah says, seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth. You'll be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. You'll be kept safe from wrath. Now, I don't know about you, but that is a very encouraging thought. When I look at the world and I look at the injustice that's being perpetrated all the time and I see evil flourishing and I go, man, I know that if God is a just God, he's going to come and wreck everything. Yet, those who seek him before that day are kept secure by him. Judgment is certain. But those who are hidden in Christ have a hope. He will preserve us and he will restore us. It's not only those in Judah. It's the meek of the earth. This isn't a word of comfort to those who worship at the altar of convenience. It's not a word of comfort to those who live in compromise and complacency, but it is a word of comfort for those who trust in the Messiah. Zephaniah sees this day where all people are gathered together, and again, the contrast is dramatic. Zephaniah 3, 8 and 9, Therefore wait for me, says the Lord, until the day I rise up for plunder. My determination is to gather the nations to my assembly of kingdoms to pour on them my indignation, all my fierce anger. All the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. For then I will restore to the peoples a pure language that they all may call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. Just right there in those two verses, Amazing contrast. In the final day of the Lord's wrath, wrath is certain. Destruction of the wicked is is sure. But so is the safety and the restoration of those who have trusted in Christ. In the same day that the wicked are destroyed, people from every tribe, every nation, and every tongue will be united under the majesty of a just and perfect king. Listen, I've read the book of Revelation several times. I've read books and studied the various theories about how it all works. And the more I study it, the less sure I am about any of the major ideas or theories about how it all works. There seems to be good arguments and bad arguments from every angle. But here's one thing I know for sure. For those who don't know Christ, the day of the Lord will be the worst day imaginable. There's nothing, nothing worse than to stand guilty before a holy God to give an account for your sin and have no one to intercede for you. For those who don't know Christ, the day of the Lord is the worst day imaginable. But at the same time, for those who do know Christ, it's the greatest day ever. I know that for sure. I mean, people ask me all the time, so are you pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib? When's the rapture going to happen? Will believers face tribulation? Listen, here's what I know for sure and what I believe that you and I would do well to focus on. You flee from God's wrath by running to Christ. Whether we're here through the tribulation, whether we're raptured out of it first, I I mean, I have an idea. We can talk about that. I I know what I think is the clearest thing, but here's what I know for sure. If you're in Christ, 
you'll be kept from wrath in some way. He will protect you and he will restore you. I'm not saying don't study Revelation. I'm not saying don't have a theory. I'm saying hold it loosely and focus on the gospel. Remember, Zephaniah preaches hope to the faithful remnant in a time when judgment is certain. Does the way that you think about the end times give you hope? Does Does it encourage you? Does it bring comfort to you? Because it should. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, Zephaniah says, seek the Lord. You'll be hidden. You'll be kept safe from disaster. But then we read things like this. And this is why I think we're just, let's just focus on the gospel. In Colossians, this theme of being hidden, we see it once more. Colossians 3, 1 through 4. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on things on earth, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. As I said, this is the greatest day imaginable. To be hidden in Christ is to be kept from wrath, is to appear with him in glory. Listen to me here. Though wrath is certain, though judgment will come, there is sure hope for those whose lives are hidden in Christ. There's sure hope for those who turn from idolatry and sin. There's sure hope for those who repent and believe in Jesus Christ as Savior and King. For us, the day of the Lord's wrath is the greatest day ever. And and here's why. One more thing from Zephaniah. Look what's promised. This is, this is what God does in the day of wrath for those who are hidden in Christ. Zephaniah 3, 15 through 17. This is just awesome. The Lord has taken away our ju- your judgments. So the things that could be held against us in God's court, every sin we ever commit, taken away. He has cast out your enemy. The king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. It's the end of spiritual opposition. It's the end, it's, it's the end of disaster. It's the end of calamity. And it's the presence of God. In that day, it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Let not your hands be weak. The Lord your God is in your midst. The mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. We come to church and we sing. We sing of God's glory. We sing God's praises. One day, in the day of the Lord's wrath, he sings for joy in his own saving work of redeeming us. Mind-blowing that God sings for joy in saving a pitiful wretch like me. But that's what the Bible says. So let's land the plane here with some application. The contrast in Zephaniah is consistent with the whole of the Bible. Consider the goodness and severity of God. Understand that the day of the Lord is coming. This is either really, really bad news or really, really good news. And it's only good news for those who are made secure in that day by Jesus Christ. Listen, there is no amount of good works that will help you prepare for the day of the Lord. There's no amount of religious duty or service. There's nothing to give or build. Only 
by turning to God by faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. That's the only thing that will ready you for that day and make it good news when in reality, for everyone apart from Christ, it's the worst news imaginable. So, second point of application, don't put that off. Zephaniah warns the complacent. Those who are just sitting on the fence, lukewarm, living as practical atheists while saying they believe in God. There's only a handful of commands in the entire book of Zephaniah. The entire thing is almost just descriptive of this day of the Lord. It's awful, brutal wrath, and then beauty of God rejoicing over his people. But there are a few commands, and one of them is this. Seek the Lord before the day of wrath comes. Seek the Lord while there's still time. In case you're sitting there condemning yourself, because some of the sinful and idolatrous practices that are mentioned here, some of those things are familiar to you. Know this. There is mercy and goodness and forgiveness in Christ regardless of how bad you think you've blown it. If you have air in your lungs and you draw breath this morning, it's evidence that God is still extending his mercy to you. You're not too far gone. Right here, right now, turn from your sin, throw off your idols, cast down your spiritual complacency, and trust Christ. The Bible says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And there's nothing more important to us as a church than to see God glorified in the salvation of the lost. Beyond that, we read in Zephaniah that God sings and rejoices in his own saving work. And so we ought to be rejoicing in God's saving work in the lives of others as well. He sings for joy over the lives of, re of the redeemed. So today, while it's still today, trust Christ and be secure in him forever. Mm -hmm.